So what I might do is just before we wrap up, um, we've got a little bit of time. Um, I'm happy to invite all the presenters back. So we've almost got like a panel. I've got a question for Glenn. Oh, sure. Um, your, your presentation showed what looked like the cover of a, uh, a, a WUSA document that was joint with Holdfast Bay. Um, is that is that a public document, Glenn, or is that internal? A master plan? Yeah, it's uh, a public document, Andrew. I think it's definitely with public money, so I can't see an issue um, releasing it. It was a um, quite a strategic document that sat alongside our stormwater management plan. I think our stormwater management plan with Hope Fast Bears overtaking it, um, where our, our interventions have really come from. I'm happy to share it, mate, yeah. It just, uh, a search of it on your website didn't come up. Yeah, I think it was kind of overtaken by the SNP. Okay. I'm happy to share that with you, mate, not a problem. Hey, and any other thoughts or observations? I'm, I'm going to share my screen just while we're having these last questions. Can you please scan the um, the survey will literally take you two minutes to do on your phone, um, and just to give us a bit of feedback um, on the on the session today. I've got one for you, Mel. Sure. I think the take up by the public sector is pretty good. Um, my question is around how we get the private sector more involved in good design and good asset handover and standard expectation. Um, have you got any thoughts on that? Uh, so we're working with Department of Environmental Water and Planning and Land Use Services at the moment. They're doing a, um, they're preparing a guideline. In fact, Rob is the consultant um, um, who's doing it. Is pre they're preparing a guideline, almost like a companion plant uh, document to the tree guideline for infield development. So it'll be a water sensitive urban design guideline for infield development. So I'm quite hopeful, and um, Rob, you might want to add you to Bob said here, that that's going to address some of those things of how to encourage the development industry to get involved. And um, Rob's actually doing some interviews with some developers coming up to sort of see their needs, their perspective. So I don't know, Rob, do you want to add to that? Oh, yeah, I think I agree, Glenn, as in sort of public sector is a little more in tune. I guess I feel that that's because there's more onus on the public sector to think about what is better from a public good perspective, um, but more closely aligned. Um, but, yeah, working on this guideline with Green, Green Adelaide, and I guess the crux of it is is the key here is that um, guidelines don't save the world, but if they can kind of nudge particularly the development sector, into you know better design outcomes um better on ground you know better integration um yeah. in the context of also having the other green home guideline like there's a sort of nice synergy there between get the green stuff right get the blue stuff right um so that's kind of where we're going with that and but it's it's fair to say that it's not we're not you know we're not embarking on a whole new change to the code so, you know, it, 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 a guideline is there to sort of try to give people the best information and some practical solutions on how to do that. Um, but we're about to find out with these interviews, like Mel just said, with some of the developers on what they think the problem is. So, therefore, what needs to go in the guideline that's going to help them. So, you know, we're, we'll you know, watch this space, I guess. And also, while I was planning this event, I did come across a fellow who's actually based in Melbourne, and he's the more of he's more of the construction side of it. And um, he said in some councils that he deals with, they can only do permeable or porous paving in their council area. So that's, that's what the planning and design or their code planning system says, which um, I found interesting. Um, and so he's building porous. Um, uh, pavements, asphalt type or resin based pavements all the time and in in small scale infill, in sort of residential um, commercial type development. So I'm um, looking to um, bring him in on a, an event later in the year where we focus on those porous pavements um, and just seeing about the constructability and mostly focusing on let's look at private land solutions. Mm. Um, only because I potentially run the risk of forgetting to do this later. Um, Rob and Mel, is the Lofty Building Group on your list of developers to speak to? No. If not, they need to be because I've spoken to them last week on this subject. Yeah. They've actually stopped using any brick paving on their projects of any nature um, because of issues they're having with 
um, uh, the workmanship or design and, and therefore recourse back on them. So moving moving them to permeable brick paving when they're not even doing normal brick or is about to become a gin, ginormous leap. And um, they've picked up in the new code the lean on permeable pavements and it sounds like there might actually be on the verge of an industry backlash of permeable because people don't know how to use it and people don't know how to build it mm. properly and they're getting failures not through the fault of permeable pavements. Mm. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I have a chat to them. So you're what? So if I hear that right, they're basically moving more to porous pavements as opposed to permeable. Is that what you're saying? Or they're going back to concrete? Basically, they're only now specifying concrete or bitumen, normal concrete or normal bitumen on their driveways. They, they're not even doing block paved driveways anymore because of the problem of the delivered products. The That's more of a skill, an industry skill gap. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. Okay. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? So we need to work on that for construction. So we're trying to get them to take a step forward where they're currently taking a step back. Yeah. Okay. Where yeah, we yeah. thought we were one step away, we're probably two. Classic, yeah. Okay. All right. So we've got a bit of work to do there. All right. Any other thoughts, comments? Just on the paving, it's worth quickly mentioning that the CCMA actually have some materials on permeable paving and they've also got a, a software program called Design Pave, which people can use for designing permeable pavement. So there's some good resources out there for them. Absolutely, I agree. They've been a really excellent resource in our development of our Wussed standard drawings as well. Um, got a question here from Rick Johnson. Um, yes, it, it's it's really around uh, how often, when it's when the rain garden has been maintained uh, frequently, how often do the teams have to visit? Now, I, I got from Rob, um, I sort of wrote down about six weeks and I sort of wrote from uh, Glenn, Glenn um, maybe monthly. So I was just sort of trying to confirm that, when you're on top of the maintenance of rain gardens, how often do you have to? Even a bit less it? than that, I would say. Yeah, you can kind of stretch it out to three, four months. It's very site specific, depending on the streets. I can think of a couple of streets in my head straight away that we're maintaining. Like, oh yeah, that one's definitely, you know, can go three to six months without much attention, um, and others um, are kind of back in that, you know, sort of three months, every two months, every six weeks, kind of. Sort of yeah, Chapel Street is a good example. It's really high profile and hence <clears throat> um, does accumulate, you know, a bit of litter and sediment. So it's more in that sort of uh, frequency. But Glenn, you got thoughts or Chris? Yeah, even Chris, because we did change it, didn't we? I don't know if Glenn or Chris are still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, now, could you want to comment on how, what we just went through with the review of the Marion contract? Initially, we were doing quarterly visits when the first, when the when it first came out, and then obviously there was an initial big clean up at the start um, that we'd priced uh, just to get them up to a, a standard. But you know, we found that, and talking to to Glenn and the team, that I think we went back to roughly it's about twenty visits a year, fortnightly, May to October, inclusively, and then probably monthly outside of of those times, and that that was probably more, yeah. I mean, and as as I said before, it depends on the actual uh, site as well, because you know, City of Marion's got that many different types of of what of sites that we're maintaining. So some will probably drop off a little bit based on on that, and others, you know, we may have to review again. It's it's just a work in progress as well. So. And I thought weed management was driving that. So if you could manage to get the plant coverage up with some rectification works, I Correct. suspect maybe over time that might drop back down a bit it's just that the, the weeds are so prolific at the minute that um that was the so it's not like the setup you're taking out that often but it's mostly weeds is, is that right yeah yeah that's correct the other i suppose you know if you look historically at the last couple of months when we've had a rain event they've been pretty full on in adelaide compared to what we normally have you know there's some, been some massive downpours so um visiting there straight after that and some of them have been out of the out of the ordinary for the time of year as well so you know it is it's it's a it's an evolving thing and and you're correct the weed the weed management's the, the issue at the moment so um Val Valis 
Valisilki, I hope I've said your name right, um, has said that monthly maintenance may not be feasible for most councils. So perhaps um, yeah, it's getting those inlets designed really well such that you're only having to get in and clean the inlets and it's not, you know, reaching the centre of the garden. So you're actually, um, the, the effort is minimal as opposed to having to get in and clean out the whole. Guess, yeah, it depends on how long, you know, monthly visits uh, strike off and then you're not there as long, I guess. And I suppose it depends on on the location as well. Um, you know, some of the high profile areas where you're actually um, servicing sites that are, are really, you know, high profile areas that get a lot of our, you know, a lot of um, ratepayers going past and, and viewing, then it's, it's it's also a PR exercise to make sure that you've got a beautiful city and, and, and whatnot. So. And I think the beauty of the um, online e-form that you've, you know, Marion have developed is that they can actually see which ones are clogging up the quickest. So it might be over time you concentrate and you visit, you know, 40% of them regularly, but the other 60% are fine with the sort of every three to four months. So, and I, so I do think that data collection is going to actually save you time in terms of planning. Yeah. Your- Mate, Mel, that's so important that condition assessment would drive the effort as far as where we put the money in the future. And I think Chris is right. If we can get on top of the density of planting, the weed control will come down. So monthly, I think maybe the first year or even two might be required to really get on top of these assets so they become community gardens, which is what the public think they are. Um, And then on top of that, as water resource managers, we start getting the functionality back. Um, so I, I kind of disagree that monthly might be too much. I think it's it probably it's required, particularly initially. I think maybe once also once you rectify some of those underperforming ones, Glenn, that might also, um, you know, yeah, get your maintenance frequency as well because we've you know got some inlets that aren't functioning, which is very common that they're getting yeah. blocked overfilled asset overfilled rain guards as rob showed in his drawing um photos that they're just there's no water getting into these systems and they just block at the inlet yeah because building on that conversation a, a lot of councils are probably coming from the perspective where they've got the mindset in their head that maintaining a rain garden in their current format is ma- maintaining something that's degraded high weeds and correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, but we potentially have two guys for two hours at every rain garden type thing, trying to do a you know, a three monthly or six monthly work work over of it. The guys on ground here, once you've got one of these things working right, I would imagine your visits are much more short, sharp, and shiny than that. And and does that then lead to the idea that there's different variants of inspection, like or, or sorry, visit like one. Yeah, is is there some inspections which are not much more than a drop past, remove a couple of shovels of inlet sediment and yep. not have to do much else, versus a second type of visit where you actually get in and get your hands dirty for a little bit? Yeah, I think that's exactly how it's going to unfold. Uh, Andrew, in that we'll be nimble and agile and we'll ultimately amend our purchase order with Chris as we get into it. And the more we maintain them and get a really healthy garden, um, we may only go over there back once every six months. This year is a wet spring, start of this whole process. The weeds were off the Richter. Um, so yeah, we, we we went back and increased the frequency. Yeah, sure. Um, just with uh, with um, Chris and also with Rob, is there any? Um, technology that you use for from a from a vehicle suction point of view or traffic management out on site because we find that um you know managing you know the the, the actual uh, sediment from the actual rain garden or, or even the um uh even the debris um is manual handling getting that out of the each garden bed because you can't get the truck close because of traffic infringements and things like that do you is there any um anything any secrets to that no uh, no <laughs> short answer unfortunately, no. um unfortunately yeah basically yeah our teams use good old smaller buckets larger buckets um as to what rob was saying previously because of the current designs and what's going on it's just it's manual labor and you get in and get down and get dirty and remind uh, the team and discuss with the team that 
you know, whatever we're doing right now, hopefully it improves consistently um, each visit and there's, there's less of it as, as we move forward and as, as we you know, work with Glenn and everybody with regards to, to replanting and, and, and you know, upgrading these sites, then the, the work involved would change. So yeah. um, there's nothing at the moment that I could probably, you know, tell you um, that, would, that would help at, at this present point in time. But, you know, my, my big takeout today was, was Rob's sump at the start, you know. So that's, that's brilliant for what we've been seeing at um, some of the sites. So Yeah, we, we tried a little bit with some of the, the suckers, but they just, they, they're either too strong, so they rip everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you you know you got to be really careful near the plants and yeah in terms of the kind of equipment that you're bringing along traffic management it was just like nah this is not worth it you know <laughs> it'd be far quicker just to get this done manually hopefully, uh, hopefully Marco is gone now uh, we just used it today for the first time but we got a uh, greystone vacuum um, unit from Queensland which is a uh, manure collection device for paddocks. Uh, it's small. All of our, um, what, most of our wassides are in a chicane format, which makes it near impossible for traffic management to do anything uh, with any bigger equipment. But the uh, Greystone vacuum, uh, the boys took it out today and uh, good feedback so far. So that's a possible option. All right, excellent. Well, that that's really good. Also, I feel like the data that, um, that Marion is starting to collect as well. If we're consistently getting a score four or five for sediment and blockage, to me that's also a sign that either um, the catchment's too big for the asset or that there's something going on in that catchment that the council needs to investigate, whether there's like construction works, um, you know, something like that that's happening that's just really having an extraordinary load coming into that. So you know, there's, a, there's a, you know, again, that data's going to help with a few alarm bells, like let's go back and have a driver in that catchment, see what's going on. Um, now, I've got a question for Rob. Um, what's the best design for a tree pit inlet for maintenance and inflow of water that you've seen? I was thinking, yeah. you answer that for me, Mel, because you've got standard drawings. Um... Well, you know, we, we, we want to, it's be interesting to know what you think of our standard drawings. Are um, I can just reel off a few quick things. Um, from a maintenance perspective, um, clear inlets. So you don't want to be poking around the kind of inlet. You want to know it's all sort of flush through um, onto the actual tree pit itself. Um, easily accessible, liftable um, lids. Um, like, yeah, I'd say maybe a 200 mil set down between the 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 inlet, so the the, the um, invert of the curb, and then the um, surface the, of of the topsoil um, to ensure that you've got enough, you know, space to accumulate um, all the sediment and the litter that will come through. Um, but yeah, mostly it's these like being able to lift the lid around the tree. That to me is sort of that's where we run into the most problems. Like once you've got the lid open and it's wide, like some of them are quite small as well. So if it's big enough, then you're easily kind of cleaning that out with a shovel or whatever you need to do. Um, knowing that the inlet isn't trapped something else, there's some little mini culvert that's sort of trying to take the water from the road into the tree and that sort of business. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're kind of saying now, yeah, you really want a minimum of 100 mil um, to that to that site entry pit, that that inlet section. Um, ideally, even bigger. Um, yes, you're getting a lot more, you know, um, flow and debris that sort of comes in. Um, but then, you know, the research is that an under, under drain is important for tree health as well and growth. So if you're retrofitting and you're able to do that, then, you know, you, you, you've got some confidence that you're not flooding the tree. Um, and when you do tree, possibly water trees out, you know, more sort of residential or open space areas, you've got a lot more options in terms of the way you can kind of manage the infiltration around the tree. Um, but in this, I'm assuming it's, you know, built up high street type of, you know, a heavily urban environment. So that's what I'd sort of talk about. Okay. So you, when you said 100 mil, you meant like a 100 mil diameter pipe from the curb invert back into No, so, so you've got to, you know, like a wherever wide it is, it can be one, 1.5 metres wide side entry pit that when the water's flowing into the, into the tree pit, the, the, so assuming the tree pit is behind the curb, so it's that first inlet section. I'm saying you want that to be at oh, least 100 mil, yep, sort of in terms of its height. So you've got what curbs are 150 or something. So you're kind of talking about that. Um, and then I'm saying you want what 200 mil drop below that level 
So you've got enough space to accumulate sediment on lid on the surface. Because if you don't, then that's where it will accumulate and then it starts to block the inlet level again. So we want to kind of get that all that accumulation to be below where the inlet's coming through. The water's flowing in off the curb. So am I hearing 300 below the invert when you say that then? The 100 plus the 200 or? No, because the, the 100 of the, is, a, is above the line of the curb. Oh, okay. so, 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 so the so the the coke bottle that's floating down the gutter is going to be sitting on the very bottom of that curb, and if that's you know fifty odd mils, then let's let's let that coke bottle flow in. Uh, so, so if you made it skinnier, then you'd trap everything in and keep it in the curb, and everyone's like, oh, that's good. We don't have all that pollution to worry about. No, it just contraps the whole system, and then I'm saying it just becomes a bit dysfunctional. Then so I'm just like, well, let all the coke bottles and anything else you want flow in. So okay. make that wide enough above the, that level, but it's throwing it below that level. Yeah. Okay. But there are two different places that we were talking about the levels. So. All right. Um, any other technical questions for the team before we wrap it up? Hopefully everyone's done the survey. We really appreciate your feedback. It helps us plan better events. So um, it literally will take you two minutes. It's, Max, it's all just tick and flick. Um, so thanks for doing that. And then really just thanks so much to all of our presenters for today. Really appreciate your time. Um, just to share that experience is invaluable for anyone who's out there scratching their head, thinking about where they're going to go next um, with their maintenance regimes. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks to all. And um, and uh, all the best. And now, like I said, our maintenance guidelines will be out soon once those isometrics are done. So, um, you know, um, and anyone contact us about the spreadsheet information as well. We can give you the draft version of the guidelines anyway. Um, it's just that the drawings are yet to be completed, but the spreadsheets are available as well. 